Hello and welcome to our 39th edition of FSI Fridays. I'm Edwin, live in Boston, joined by... Johansson, live in Charlotte. Hey, Johansson, happy Friday. I'm really excited about today's topic. What do we have lined up? Thanks, Edwin, and those in the audience for joining today. What we're going to talk about is diversity and inclusion and what it really means and how it's at the forefront of corporate culture conversations. Next, we'll hear about why DNI matters in financial services organizations and help leaders think critically about the design and success of initiatives. Last but not least, we'll walk through some really cool demos on how the Group Connect app can help employees connect, elevate conversations, and help leaders track progress towards their goals. Then we'll wrap it up with Q&A today on FSI Fridays. <laughs> As a quick reminder, please use the Q&A window and we'll monitor for questions during the presentation. Let's get started and meet the presenters for today. Johansson, who's our special guest this week? Thanks, Edwin. We're thrilled to be joined by three guests today. Victoria, let's start with you. Can you share with the audience what your role is at Microsoft and what your typical day is like? We also heard that you may have a run for the office someday or maybe a future Olympian based on some of the skills you have. Yes, thank you, Johansson. So my name is Victoria and I'm a customer success manager here at Microsoft. So my day-to-day -day work is really helping our customers in capital markets through their deployment and adoption of Microsoft Teams. And yes, to what you alluded to, I was actually a competitive debater and Frisbee player in college. So I have some good backup career options, it seems. Thanks for sharing that, Victoria. Uh, I was in speech and debate back in high school, but more focused on speech. So I'm stating now that I will concede on all your points today. Uh, we're also honored to be joined by Sue Griffin. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, what's your role at Microsoft? And we also hear that before a career in finance and technology, you dabbled in Hollywood. Yeah, thanks, Johansson. Um, Sue Griffin, I am an industry executive in the capital markets team in U.S. financial services. I've been at Microsoft for about a year now, a little bit over a year, all during COVID. So it's been a wild ride. Um, but prior to that, I came... I, from uh, Wall Street. I spent 20 plus years in financial services, both on the sell side and the buy side. And my day-to-day -day job really is to work with our the field and our customers in capital markets and help connect those dots about what's happening in the industry with the solutions that we can provide at Microsoft. And yes, before all of this, um, the best job I've probably ever had, and I love my job now, but I was an extra in a movie when the summer I was 13. It was a movie starring Woody Allen and Bette Midler. It was not a great movie, but I mean, I may seem like a natural because I've been on screen before. You are absolutely a natural, Sue, and I'm going to have to go and check that movie out. Uh, Ravi, thanks for being on the show here as well with us. Can you share what your role is at Microsoft? We also hear you are a natural athlete, similar to Victoria, and even a professional team where they use a wicket. Oh, oh this is interesting. Uh, folks, by the way, I'm Ravinder Bengale. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here. I, actually, I'm a modern work customer success manager here at Microsoft and work with financial services customers to help them with the adoption of Microsoft technology, especially Teams. I've been with Microsoft for about five years right now, based in New York office here. And about the interesting fact that you talked about, actually, I'm, I manage and captain a cricket team. It's just a local club here, basically, I'm just having fun. That's great, Ravi. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I was a pitcher back in high school, but I always wanted to learn how to throw, a, I think it's called a googly. Um, so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that together. All right, let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, Victoria, uh, what is the psychology of diversity? You know, How does that tie into Microsoft's mission and why is it so important? Sure. Thanks, Edwin. So I think we really want to begin um, with saying, you know, Microsoft's mission, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with, is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And what this means for us really is that everything from our technology solutions to our culture, we think about people first. I think at Microsoft, we also recognize that the world is becoming increasingly more diverse. So this means that it's imperative more than ever that people not only are, but also feel included in the workplace. And then also from a business perspective, we've seen the data and we know that socially diverse organizations actually drive better business outcomes. So why is this? It's really the psychology of diversity, which you see here. 
The psychology of diversity basically states that socially diverse groups yield more innovation than homogeneous ones because people are working within a wider range of cultures, ethnicities, worldviews, and a multitude of other attributes. And what this means is that we show up to work a little bit differently. So we show up better prepared, we anticipate different outcomes, and we really work a little bit harder towards achieving a consensus. So in essence, when employees are challenged you know, to work with a wider range of perspectives, it actually drives more innovation. And what is particularly interesting is seeing this trend over time. So the data that you're seeing here is a report from study that a report from McKinsey that actually tracked this in groups that are similar and a little bit more diverse. And what we're seeing is that non-diverse teams can actually accelerate in performance much quicker. However, they'll eventually hit what's known as a sameness barrier in which they become stagnant over time in their performance. However, more diverse teams might be quicker to accelerate because of this productive friction that I alluded to earlier. However, over time, they will perform groups that are much more similar. Thanks, Victoria. That was really interesting. Um, diversity and inclusion are actually common terms that are used often together and in some cases maybe even used interchangeably, but they are in fact different. Um, can you help us deconstruct these two words and uh, it's important to understand what they really mean? Yes, of course, Johansson. So I think a lot of the work that we've done up until this point is understanding the why of why diversity and inclusion is important for organizations. However, a lot of the focus recently is moving towards the how. How do we actually reach our objectives and our desired outcomes? And at Microsoft, our own thinking actually started with constructing these two terms. So let's think about it a little bit further. Diversity is often understood as the full range of human and organizational differences and similarities that we have. So to many of us, diversity is commonly understood as a range of skin colors, abilities, genders, cultures, etc. And inclusion is most commonly understood as the process of effectively integrating everyone. It's seen as being proactive about involving people of all types in work in our personal lives. However, it's really important to take actually a step back and look at diversity and inclusion as much broader than this. So diversity is actually a collection of visible and indivisible, invisible, I'm sorry, similarities and differences that we have. And our range of diversity as such is much wider than we commonly understand it to, have, to be. Inclusivity is about focusing not just about proactively engaging and including people, but it's really about focusing on the individual needs of every person, ensuring that we've set up the right considerations in place for him and her to achieve their full potential. So it's really important to understand the terminology so that we can better provide solutions and design you know, processes to put in place. So to illustrate this point a little bit further, what you're seeing here is actually the full spectrum of diversity from one's personality to our behavioral traits. And what organizations should really do is consider how their DNI initiatives are setting up the conditions to leverage the power of the differences and similarities that we all have to effectively integrate everyone into common objectives, common goals, and a common culture. Victoria, thanks for helping us make that distinction and how it basically uh, it all brings us together. Um, so in order for organizations to implement this, what, what are the critical activities that are required to build this into a successful approach? Yes, yeah, so Edwin, I think it's uh, you know understanding the terminology which we just went through. But one thing that are you know that everyone can do is begin to adopt frameworks for how they view their DNI initiatives. So a common one that's often applied is the framework of cultural competency. So cultural competency is basically a set of business skills that enable effective collaboration, alignment, and communication within organizations, and they require three key things put in place. The first is that organizations must have the knowledge and awareness of culture and cultural differences, plus the ability to actually identify what gaps they may have. So, you know, we can't actually move forward without an awareness of where we're starting. The second is having the emotional intelligence to leverage and bridge cultural differences by adapting our behavior. So it requires a sense of personal reflection from each one of us about how you know, we can reflect on our place and our actions to show up better as individuals. And the third piece is really bridging all of you know, these first two into business activity. So organizations must have the business ability to apply cultural and emotional awareness to one's areas of responsibility to achieve the business outcomes that they would like. So it's you know, taking the awareness, having a sense of personal responsibility, and then tying it to our work experiences and activities. 
And what we see is that when organizations can effectively implement all three of these, they see really good outcomes. They actually foster greater inspiration, trust, collaboration, and motivation amongst colleagues, partners, and customers, anyone who they might be working with. And overall, we're seeing that people will show up better as leaders and also as team members. Thanks, Victoria. Let's turn it over to you, Sue. As someone who's been in the FSI industry for over 20 years and work closely with our customers, as you think about our financial services audience here today, why should they care? And what does this journey look like? Thanks, Johansson. Yeah, so financial service or services organizations have traditionally been focused on financial metrics as um, for success, revenue, EBITDA, earnings per share, et cetera. And while diversity and inclusion may have been acknowledged as good things to have, it's not until relatively recently that the finance industry has been able to link DNI to the bottom line. Strong DNI programs have been shown to be correlated with increased revenues, improved risk management, and better growth prospects. So I just want to highlight a few of the many, many examples of why DNI is absolutely a business imperative in the financial services industry. First, employee attraction and retention. In an industry where the investment into training each employee is high and the competition talent for talent is fierce, especially now with the technology industry, creating a strong culture of DNI will help minimize employee turnover. Next, meeting client demand. Financial services firms are facing a record low interest rate environment right now, shrinking margins and fee compression. So offering exceptional and personalized client engagement is a distinct competitive advantage. This means meeting the evolving client expectations and the requirements that demand their financial services provider to invest in their DNI initiatives. Institutional investors continue to develop and refine their own policies regarding board diversity. While gender diversity and public company boards have been in focus for some time now, institutional investors are also increasingly focusing on racial and ethnic diversity as part of their evolving approach to board diversity. And that this will translate to who they also do business with. Also, younger generations of investors like millennials and Gen Z are more driven to do business with firms that align to their ESG and DNI standards. And finally, better financial performance. One example is that recently NASDAQ filed a proposal with the SEC to adopt new listing rules related to board diversity and disclosure, which if, if adopted would require listed comp companies on NASDAQ to publicly disclose consistent, transparent diversity statistics regarding their board. As part of the rationale for these new listing requirements, NASDAQ's proposal presents analysis of over two dozen studies that found an association between diverse boards and better financial performance and corporate governance. Other studies have shown that female traders bring different skill sets to the table that help them, make, help them excel at trading and portfolio management. Now, there's been so much progress in the DNI space and financial services, certainly since I was coming up in the industry. And different firms are at different points in their journey towards achieving a workplace that is truly diverse and inclusive. But universally, there's still so much work to be done, especially in this post-COVID world of remote and hybrid workplaces where everyone may not be in the same physical space. It's even more essential that employees feel seen, heard, connected, and included to bring out the best performance in all. That's great, Sue. Uh, you know, thanks for highlighting some of the many important points that make it more real than just, you know, nice to have, like stronger bottom lines and better financial performance and retention. I know for one, um, there are a lot of customers that I, I'm working with that have DNI uh, focused activities, uh, State Street being one of them. I just want to call them out. Um, they're doing some really amazing work around that area, um, and I love working with them. So let's have you shift a bit and put your perspective, uh, prescriptive guidance hat on. What should FSI orgs think about and actions that they should take to get started with the journey? Sure. If firms want to make a real difference in their DNI, they need to take a few steps. I mean, one is to understand the current state and really do a, a deep and introspective analysis of its own baseline, including existing behaviors, barriers to improvement, quantitative and, and qualitative data points. The fact base will provide a starting point to assess the gap with the target. And I think a lot of firms have done this, but um, that's definitely the starting point. 
Then second is to set the right target. Creating an inclusive organization is a worthy cause in any context, but creating an understanding and linkage between how DNI helps the business is critical to align incentives. Um, third is to ensure that the CEO and the entire C-suite own and drive the efforts from the top. It's imperative to have senior management own and continuously communicate the importance of DNI and to lead by example. It's also critical for those with an impact over employees' career trajectories and opportunities to be part of spreading the message and leading the organization's DNI actions. Number four is to make it more about metrics, and it's a common mistake to implement solely metric-based DNI goals. Doing so can lead business line managers aiming to meet quotas without consideration for inclusion. As a key part of clearly outlined expectations, those managers should be encouraged to demonstrate observable behaviors to promote DNI and show inclusive leadership. And then finally, and, and this can arguably be the most important, is that you have to continually make supporting changes to the DNI infrastructure. The organization needs to strengthen their HR policies, processes, procedures, starting from a clear vision and goals. And it can translate those into formal and well-ingrained policies, including flexibility, diversity overlays over talent, creating community through employee groups. And then it needs mechanisms such as collecting employee feedback and measurements if desired, to create a feedback loop for a more agile and flexible scaffolding, which will make DNI more effective over time. Sue and Victoria, thank you for providing such a strong foundation of why diversity and inclusion is so important to our financial services customers. Um, let's turn it over to you, Ravi. Um, you know, we've got a lot of technology and a lot of capabilities within Microsoft to help our customers through this journey, and we've done some of this ourselves. Um, can you walk us through this Group Connect app, which is built on top of Microsoft Teams? How did this app come to fruition? And were there specific challenges um, that really didn't have solutions that we were trying to address here? Yes, middle of last year, we started receiving a lot of requirements from various companies in different industries to have a technology platform, uh, to have their employees come together, uh, build communities, and build connections uh, in their team's environment. And this is where we worked with uh, different companies, understood their requirements, you understood their use cases, and built this uh, diversity and inclusion connect app initially. And we realized that there are different use cases. And now this is a Group Connect app that we just released a few weeks ago. Uh, so, Ravi, no, that, thanks for uh, giving us that background. Teams have become a really great way to unify collaboration experiences. And you spoke about the ability to connect communities. Talk to us about how and why Microsoft chose to integrate that app with Teams. And can you highlight the different core capabilities? Yes, yeah, so uh, when the requirements started coming in, Teams was a natural platform to build this around as employees are expending more and more time in Teams, uh, collaborating with their associates, working with their uh, teammates on files, documents, and meetings, etc. So the natural, uh, natural flow was to bring that all activity from the ERGs or the groups into Teams. So uh, we developed Teams as an extensible platform. And as you might have already seen, Teams in action with the uh, various applications you use uh, from Microsoft as well as third parties. So we built this application as an uh, as a application app template that could be utilized by any company. And the capabilities that we brought this initially uh, for these particular applications are really based on the simple use cases that we observed from the various companies that we worked with. One of the very quicker scenarios that our organizations wanted was to uh, facilitate discovery of the employee resource groups, uh, like find the groups, register those groups, or, and actually have people an easy access where they can join certain communities. Then there are obviously use cases that were uh, sparking connections between employees, uh, giving an opportunity for employees across different regions, different communities to uh, build relationships together. 
Obviously, another scenario was communications, because this is, again, a key part that uh, leaders have been struggling with. And then we built in capabilities re uh, related to communications in this particular uh, application. And additionally, we can add additional tools like ideas, uh, innovations, or uh, bulletins, etc., to this experience to make this a wholesome experience for the, uh, for the ERGs or the employee groups. Thanks, Ravi, for walking us through that. You know, it's really exciting to see this framework around how we can use teams to be able to connect these various different communities. But maybe let's dive a little deeper into some of these core capabilities. So, Victoria, let's start with maybe the registration process. How does that work if I want to have a community group or I want to connect to one or register one? And what does that registration process look like? Yes, Johansson. So I think as Robbie mentioned, one of the things that most commonly was asked for from our customers was starting in the easiest way possible. Let's facilitate greater connection amongst our employees. So what this portion of the application is really designed to do is to provide visibility to different groups that might exist with the organization and to actually facilitate connection by having people join these groups. So what can be done is that organizations can apply or approve a variety of groups within the org, and then employees can actually search for these groups within Teams directly and join so that they have that connection. What's nice is also that, you know, they can exist within Teams and be applied to different Teams channels, but they could also exist outside of Teams and be taken to other sites like Yammer or SharePoint. Thanks, Victoria. Discovery is definitely a big part of it. Um, can you talk about some examples and use cases? I know we have many of these at Microsoft internally as well, so can you go through uh, some of this list? Yes, of course, Edwin. So, you know, there is no set guideline on, you know, you can only have these groups. It's really about what the organization needs. So what you're seeing here is actually some common use cases that we're seeing. You know, a common example is employee resource groups, but then there's also other things that you can implement, affinity groups, social causes that might be top of mind within your organization, local interest groups if you want to break it down by geography, and then of course professional development. So there really is no limit. It's about meeting the needs of the organization and the needs of the employees. And what is nice about this too, additionally for our customers, is that anything can be rebranded and configured to adapt to your environment. Thanks, Victoria. So Ravi, we covered community and groups, but if we want to go one level deeper and we're part of these groups and we want to drive better one-on-one -on -one connections uh, within these groups or across groups, how do we recreate those impromptu moments, those kind of walking across in the office and seeing someone and drive those one-to-one -one connections? Yeah, and, and that has been a, a challenge across the organizations uh, that we have talked to. And that's where we build up this app template called Icebreaker and build that capability into the group uh, connect app. What this Icebreaker capability does is actually just bring your teams together by pairing uh, two random team members every week or every month, depending on your configuration, and gives them an op opportunity to uh, talk to each other, propose meetings with each other, and just uh, strengthens the personal connections that you have across the organization. And this is, again, you can decide whether you want to have this capability enabled for your particular ERG or you have it disabled. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, you know, that's actually really exciting. I feel like FSI Fridays to me is like this connect employee. So I'm going to start. I, I love meeting new people. So I'm going to go check this out as well. Um, so, Victoria, you know, one of the things that we heard from Sue is communications and culture. Uh, one of the things organizations are challenged with is how to target communications to specific ERGs. I know we have capabilities to do that. So with organizations adopting Microsoft Teams and the flow of their work, what opportunities do we have to increase engagement and solve some of these communication challenges? Can you talk to us how, uh, you know, through how uh, do we do this efficiently? Yes, Edwin, you know, something that I see very commonly from our customers is saying, how do we communicate with our employees? How do we engage them a little bit better? And one of the things that Sue mentioned was, you know, how do we not only drive corporate communications, but also mem uh, messaging from our senior leadership to make sure that they know that this is a priority for the organization and the importance of it. So this part of the Connect app really allows you to drive forward that sense of communication in an organized way, directly reaching employees. So you have some common scenarios here that you see, everything from alerts to company-wide announcements, anything coming from leadership, any type of messaging that they might want to take around an initiative or a specific issue. And then, of course, you can always survey employees, too, through these adaptive cards. So it's really getting that level of engagement and really reaching the employee right where they are. 
And what's especially nice too is that you know we are in a state where we are being reached in by various channels, email being the most prominent one, and it is a lot of communication. But what Teams aims to do is because that is where we're spending our time, these notifications get pushed out in a one-to-one one, one, -to -one chat. I'm sorry. So they're really reaching the employee directly and you have that engagement that you're looking for. And in terms of capacity, you're able to see that the messaging pipeline can reach 200,000 employees in less than one an hour. So really it is effective, it's efficient, and it's really allowing you to have that targeting messaging coming from the top down. Thanks, Victoria. And, you know, you talk about the communications and, and typically those communications are really coming from the top down and it really shows that support. But instead of just sending out communications out constantly, how can we potentially drive better engagements and potentially crowdsource ideas from employees who are leading this day to day? Ravi, could you talk to us about uh, the Idea Hub? Yeah, actually, uh, this is one of the core tenants, again, of this particular app to have engagement, not just from the leadership, but also from the, the members of the ERGs. So as a part of this, uh, we built a capability called Idea Hub or Employee Ideas uh, in this particular application. And what it really enables the ERG leaders basically to generate ideas or organize ideas by campaigns where the ERG leaders can create campaigns, employees can submit their ideas, or they can review, manage, vote, uh, certain ideas uh, for, for the organization. And this just increases the team morale, uh, engagement across the organization, and also uh, gives their managers and own, uh, owners of the ERGs uh, a platform for getting uh, in, insights from their communities. Hey, Ravi, I know, um, you know a lot of us here have great ideas, and uh, it's always tough to be able to get that to resonate with people or upvote it. I mean, I, I love the format of this, so um, it's something I'm definitely also going to try out. Uh, you know, Victoria, um, everyone is there, uh, on their own journey for DNI. What's a good way for employees to access information at their own pace or as they start engaging more in these conversations? Yes, I mean, I think that's a really, you know, fair a uh, point and a good observation is that everyone is on their own journey. Everyone accesses information a little bit differently. So we really wanted to create a space too where people could go and seek out information by themselves. So the first component was accessing specific groups, but you also have the ability to create a company bulletin, which is essentially a place where employees can access information and additional resources and really absorb it at their own pace. It could be FAQs, links, a list of contacts, basically whatever you need it to be within your organization. You also have the ability to develop a Group Connect bot. So basically, this is a much more interactive experience, but it's still allowing employees to you know, have an inquiry, submit it, and get a response back from the organization. So something as simple as submitting a question around DNI or anything else related, and them getting a direct response. And you know, again, they're seeking out this information, but you have a couple of different ways in which they can access it. Thank you, Victoria and Ravi, for really walking us through each of these individual areas of the Group Connect app. But I know our audience loves to see demos. So Ravi, do you mind sharing your screen and maybe walking us through the flow here and, and show our audience how easy it is uh, to interact with this type of application? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, here is the Group Connect app that we have here. Uh, Group Connect app is pinned on the left-hand rail of Teams interface. And one of the first use cases that we talked about was finding, joining uh, a particular ERG. So Discover Groups is a menu that we have here, which shows all the available ERGs that are currently listed and approved by the organization a user can come in and look at the ERGs. They can filter uh, based on location or tags and find the ERGs that they are looking for. If they don't find a particular ERG or they are part of another ERG that they want to include in this experience, they can click on add a group here and uh, bring in the ERGs that they have. This could be based on Teams, this could be based on Yammer or SharePoint. Uh, from here, uh, we talk. Uh, the users can just join, click on the particular ERG, and join that particular uh, ERG. Thanks, Ravi. That was really easy to be able to discover, filter, and find the groups that you want to be able to connect to, and you can even add your own group. But can you show us some of the communication capabilities that are a part of this app as well? Yes, certainly. As an end user. Uh, 
the end user will be able to see this chat option here within the Group Connect app. And here, uh, they can get their messaging from the leadership displayed. And here, I'm just showing an example of a particular message that was uh, sent out to the communicator part of the application. Again, this could be done by the HR team, internal comms team, or a specific set of identified people who can control uh, the messaging to the organization or the ERGs. And this is just an example of of the particular message. The key part is that this card is a lot easier to read and a lot more engagement uh, for this particular uh, cards compared to the messaging that you would see in the emails. That's our experience. So I talked about the uh, HR admins or internal comm team members who would be able to create the communications uh, for the organization. And they have a particular authors app that we have in here for the, their particular group. And here they can define the messaging uh, that needs to be sent. They can chat about a particular a message in their own post, in their own teams, and uh, have that message ready before it goes out to uh, the organization. Before sending it out to the whole organization or the set of people, they can preview this in a channel where they can talk among themselves, get the feedback, and then finalize it before they send this out to the organization. And a few of the things that just uh, go through here is that like the messages for the uh, title, you have the particular uh, picture, et cetera, specific message that you want to send out. And then also key part is uh, who you want to target this message. Again, this could be part uh, sent out to specific teams. This could be sent out to all the people uh, or specific distribution groups. Uh, and, and this capability exists. And again, the, there are organizations who have modified this to their specific needs. Ravi, thanks for showing that. Um, you know, one of the things I really like was the ability uh, to crowdsource that, uh, you know, was, was talked about. Can you show us how that works? Yes, certainly. Uh, for that, let's go to a particular ERG and I can demonstrate that capability. So here I am in a uh, particular ERG, and you can see multiple uh, options available here for this particular ERG. One of the uh, I options we talked about is the ideas. So this is the ideas application that you see where uh, the associates are able to look at the ideas, look at the campaigns. They can click on a particular campaign and submit an idea for the particular camp. Here you see the example for work from anywhere. There is an uh, idea, There is you have an option to upload a particular ideas. Uh, as the end users can submit an idea, as an administrator, you can create campaigns which, can, which the associates can submit ideas for. Okay, in this Manage Ideas app, uh, this is for the owners, uh, where the owners can add a campaign, uh, that could be utilized for the particular ERG. As you can see here, this is a view for the adding a campaign where you can name the campaign description, you can define the timelines for the campaign, and then folks will be able to uh, add ideas related to the campaign. So, Ravi, one of the things that we use inside of Microsoft as part of this app is the ability to use natural language and just ask a question from the app. So, if I didn't know what an ERG was, how would I be able to do that, and how would this app help me find out that information? Yeah, so in the Group Connect app, we have built-in capabilities for the question and answers, where you are able to ask questions and the app would respond with the particular answer. Again, this is that you can control as an organization. You will have the ability to set the question and answers for the particular topic and the users would be able to get the answers for that. And this is just an example here. What is in the LGN question and then appropriate answers are provided for the user. Ravi, thanks for walking us through that live demo. I'm really excited about this app and how it can accelerate collaboration, especially from that TNI perspective. Uh, Victoria, can you walk us through the call to actions for the audience and how they could get started on this journey? 
Sure. Thanks, Edwin. And thank you, Johansson. We were really excited to bring this to FSI Fridays and we hope it was, you know, of interest to everybody. If you're, you know, ready to move forward and you'd like to deploy the Connect app within your environment, you actually have the ability to build it yourself. We have a step-by-step -step guidance available online for the Connect app. You can uh, view the article on our Microsoft Docs and we also have an article on GitHub that walks you step-by-step -step to how to deploy it. If you're curious about learning more, we're happy to have a conversation. So I encourage you to read Reach out to your account teams and connect with your customer success manager, which would be Robbie, myself, or one of our colleagues. And we're happy to walk any group, you know, HR, ERG leads um, through the application to show them the capabilities, a little bit of the philosophy. And then we're also happy to walk and understand your technical requirements and help align the right resources to help you get up and running. Sue, Ravi, Victoria, thank you again for sharing your time and perspectives. This has been a really super inspiring discussion, and I'm positive our viewers have learned a wealth of valuable information. That's right, Johansson. So first, we learned that there are many compelling reasons for why diversity and inclusion should be incorporated as a core mission for financial services organizations. We also provided five core frameworks to help financial services organizations with their D&I goals by helping employees easily connect to communities within their organization, and then use these connections and resources to affect real change and accelerate innovation. Finally, we saw a really cool demo by Ravi on the Group uh, Connect app in action, bringing these ideas to life and showing how it can be done. Really great stuff. Uh, Johansson, let's move on to Q&A. What are some of the viewers asking? Thanks, Edwin. So we've got a question coming in that is around, how difficult is this to set up in my organization or for an organization to even stand up these capabilities. Uh, Ravi, could you talk about this? Is this something that will take you know months to, to deploy? Hi, uh, as uh, Victoria mentioned, we have provided the code base and instructions, deployment guide, etc., on the GitHub page for you to download that and deploy that in your organization. The deployment process should take few hours, uh, provided you have necessary access privileges for your enterprise uh, systems and you have the necessary people aligned. I myself was able to build similar application in about three hours time frame. Ravi, I'm kind of curious too, um, you know, a couple hours, that's really amazing. If someone were able to build this from scratch, how do you think that would take? How long would that take? So, so to give you an idea, we started this process about six months ago to understand the requirements from different organizations and then create this app. So you can imagine the amount of time that would take for organizations if they had to build this from scratch. That's great. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, Sue, I hear, I see another question here. I'm thinking this is for you. Um, this is a really interesting talk. Thanks for the live demo. Uh, from your perspective of or FSI organizations, why is this solution particularly helpful? I think because recently, you know, relatively recently, financial services organizations have stood up a lot of um, employee resource groups and policies and procedures and communities in an effort um, to catch up on DNI. It's really hard right now to kind of get your arms around it and really get involved in a meaningful way. Um, and this is something that could really help you find the the groups and the communities that you can make the most impact in. I couldn't agree more, Sue. I think just the ability to bring it all together uh, in an application and then deploy it in a matter of hours, like Ravi talked about, can really help accelerate those initiatives. Um, we've got another question coming in here, um, and it's a little bit of a comment. It says, great to see Microsoft investing in these types of programs. What opportunities are there for financial services customers to learn from Microsoft's approach to diversity and inclusion? Um, Victoria, do you want to take this one? Sure, Johansson. Yeah, I think, you know, when I think about my job, one of the best parts is that we're really able to take, you know, the technology solutions that we have in our approach to how we do things and really, you know, have discovery sessions with our customers of what they're also doing. And it's very much a conversation. So it's about marrying everything together. I think in terms of, you know, what can be done next is really engaging in the conversation and really tying the proper solution. So, you know, this being a great one um, and kind of going from there. Well, it looks like we're out of time. That was an awesome conversation. Thanks again for attending via YouTube or watching live and asking questions. We're also open to your constructive feedback. So please send us your comments and suggestions at aka.ms forward slash FSI Fridays feedback.
And be sure to catch recordings of our previous sessions on FSI Friday's YouTube channel at aka.ms slash FSI Friday's recap, where you can also post any follow-up questions that weren't covered today. If you enjoyed this video and you're watching live, don't forget to like and please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content. So we first like to thank everyone for all their support for FSI Fridays. We've been getting messages around the world from customers on the impact this has ma been making and the information that it's been providing in a fun and consumable way. Yep, uh, that's right, Johansson. We're taking a hiatus and aiming to return in the late summer with a reboot, FSI Fridays 2.0. So please reach out with any innovative ideas, topics, or if your organization wants to participate as a guest speaker. Special shout outs to our video producer behind the scenes, Alan Mock, for keeping this thing at a high production quality. So stay tuned for our reboot. Thanks and see you next time on FSI Fridays. Thank you.